right, good morning, Mercy family. Good morning, good morning. Uh, we have a brand new series of sermons we are starting today. I am hyped. So New Testament, first book of the New Testament, Matthew's Gospel. Make your way there to chapter 5. Uh, chapter 5, Matthew's Gospel. Uh, for those of you that were not in, uh, oh, I guess that's all of you, in the 8 o'clock service um, here at Providence Road, we had another baptism. I'm just celebrating new life in Christ. We can see to praise God for what he is doing around here. It's awesome. Um, if you are new with us, I do want to say it's a great time for you to be hopping in because we've got a new sermon series. And this series is going to be about eight weeks long, uh, take us up to and through Easter. It usually, which, by the way, y'all, Easter's like five, six weeks away. This is insane. Um, but it usually takes you about five weeks anyways to figure out if a church is right for you. You'll know in about five minutes if it's not, like for sure not right for you. But if you made it to this part, I assume, at least today, you're thinking about sticking around, maybe. Um, so what I'd say is give it about five weeks to try and figure it out. And in that, uh, one of the things that you can do uh, next weekend, we have something we call starting point, usually the first weekend of every month. And it's kind of our short orientation. It's after every worship service, 15 to 20 minutes led by the leaders of our church. We just take some time to explain who we are, what we're about, and give you the chance to ask some questions and figure out, is this the right spot for me? So that's next weekend. I'm giving you one week's advance notice. But with that, Matthew 5 is where we're going to be. Um, here's what I want to do. I'm going to read the sermon series text, the passage that we're going to spend uh, eight weeks in, because it's only just a few verses, Matthew 5, 1 through 12. Um, it is so important that I just, I, basically I want to show you over the course of this morning why it's so important that we would camp out in it for a couple of months. But first, we read it, okay? And I know you just sat down. But this is one of those that I just want you to stand up in honor of reading God's word. So if you can, if you can hop back up, if your knees crinkle and pop like mine, I'm sorry, um, but you know, it's worth it. All right, here we go. This is Matthew 5. I'm going to read it. Verses 1 through 12. When he saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to teach them, saying, blessed are the poor in spirit. For the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the humble, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. You are blessed when they insult you and persecute you and falsely say every kind of evil against you because of me. Be glad and rejoice. Because your reward in heaven, your reward is great in heaven. For that is how they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the word of the Lord. You can be seated. Eight weeks in these 12 verses. This short teaching of Jesus is the opener to his maybe most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. Commonly referred to this opening section, these 12 verses are commonly referred to in church uh, circles as the Beatitudes. Maybe you have that written in your Bible, a little heading. Um, as far as pronunciation goes, we had a little disagreement uh, this week on our staff team. Some of them were like, it's the Beatitudes. And I'm like, I don't know what you're going after, <laughs> but we're in the South, and so we're going to stretch out them syllables, and it's the Beatitudes for the course of this series. Um, next week, we're going to get into the first one. There in verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. But today... Man, I kind of want to just give you an overview. Uh, each subsequent week, we'll just go one at a time because uh, they summarize life in the kingdom of God. It's really good. But, but first, I want to give you an overview because in this kingdom of God, as we just read it there, you know, the, the theme of our series is the upside down kingdom. And maybe you feel it just right there. And what I'm trying to get at with that title is just saying, man, there's the way that the world calls us to build our lives, to build our kingdoms and the kingdoms of the world. It's a pursuit of more, pursuit of more money, 
pursuit of more romance, pursuit of more power and more strength. And that will ultimately give you the blessings of a kingdom in this world. And what Jesus seems to be saying, just in the, hopefully maybe you saw it in the quick read through, is it seems to be the opposite, right? See, the things that you thought would build a kingdom to help you flourish, what you know if you've lived any amount of time actually don't. But instead, the true blessed life is living in a way that almost feels completely contradictory to the world. And yet there, in Jesus' kingdom, is true life. So before we go, just, I think there each one is so worth, I mean, this is a, a whole lot of ink has been spilled on the Beatitudes. If that's because it's a holy just spot where we're listening in to what it looks like to live in God's kingdom. But before we just go one by one, I want to take today and explain their purpose and power as a whole unit. So today's sermon, I'm going to try this, okay? It's kind of an introduction to the whole thing, all right? So I've got four sections to this sermon. It almost feels like, um, I don't know, it's going to be a lot coming at you, all right? Four sections today. First is the purpose of the Beatitudes. We're going to look at that. Then after that, we're going to talk about what it means to be blessed, because Jesus says that a whole lot in here. What does this word blessed mean? The difficulty of the Beatitudes, and then finally, the victory inside the Beatitudes. So we start with the purpose. Here's the purpose. I'll go ahead and give it to you right out front. You note takers can have it. The Beatitudes reveal to us the blessed life in God's kingdom. While we'll spend our time concentrated on these 12 verses, you got to remember that where this thing is, like this is a part of Matthew's gospel, to fully understand the purpose of the Beatitudes, we got to zoom out and see where they fit, okay? And that's true in any story. Drop you in the middle of it, you need to know some context, right? Well, let's say you're a Spider-Man fan, okay? You love the Spider-Man movies, right? Got Tom Holland doing his thing. But you've never seen any other Marvel movie, and all of a sudden, I turn on Avengers Infinity War sitting on my couch, and I turn it on right to the scene where Iron Man is holding Spider-Man as he flitters away into Thanos dust or whatever, right? And that's your first exposure to any of the Marvel universe. You're like, what am I watching? Where is Zendaya? We have a real problem and I'm concerned, right? What's going on here? You need backstory. Thankfully, Matthew's backstory is a lot easier to explain than the Marvel universe, but you do need to know it, okay? In this part of the gospel, Matthew's doing, he's introducing us in chapters five through seven to Jesus, the teacher. And then right after that, in chapters eight and nine, it's Jesus, the healer, okay? And they're right back to back. And I'll, I'll, it's very intentional. And I'll show you the, the whole section, Matthew five through nine, Jesus, the teacher, Jesus, the healer is bookended. Matthew basically says the same thing twice. So Matthew chapter four, verse 23, front end, this is right before the passage we just read. Matthew says, now Jesus began to go all over Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease. See that? Preaching and healing, right? Preaching and healing every disease and sickness among the people. Now, you go to Matthew 9 at the end of the section on Jesus as the teacher and the healer. Matthew 9, 35, look what it says. Jesus continued. <laughs> in the Matthew 4, it was Jesus began, and now it's continued going around to all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, teaching, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every sickness. What Matthew seems to be doing in this, again, the backstory, the bigger picture, is giving us some teachings of our Lord to show us the nature of the kingdom, and then the miracles of our Lord to show us the power of the kingdom. Now, why does that matter? Why take the time? Listen, because one of the common errors I see in our broader world, and it even shows up in the church, is embracing one side or the other of Jesus. Some want to focus on his teachings only, claiming, hey, he was a good ethical teacher. He showed a good way to live, but they want to deny his power. I see that a lot in the secular humanist crowd. And maybe you're here, you're not a Christian, you are observing, you're not necessarily antagonistic towards Jesus. You may say, yes, you heard, you heard me read that. You're like, that was really powerful. Blessed are the meek, blessed are the merciful. That resonates, it's good teaching. But then right after that, he's going to talk about how he cast out demons and stilled storms. And you're, you're skeptical. Well, Matthew is making sure that you see his teaching and his power together. He does not let you accept Jesus as a good teacher only. But then there are others who love the idea of Jesus as a miracle worker. 
Like there's kind of a charismatic fascination with his power. But when it comes to his instructions on your life, like guard your tongue, stay faithful in your marriage, love your enemy, die to yourself in service to God and others, that's too invasive. You don't want any part of it. Matthew says, I'm sorry, you can't have the miracles of the kingdom without the king of the kingdom. You can't have his power in your life without his authority in your life. And I see it, again, broader culture, but in the church as well. I I see in the church, we got some that come from a background of, man, I want to focus on Jesus's rules. What has he called us to do? And that is what we need to spend our time focused on. And the charismatic stuff, the power of God weirds you out, right? But then you have others who are just, man, I want the experience. Well, not, and it even it comes out when you come to church. I want the experience. I want to feel a certain way. And if I feel a certain way, that's what I'm really after. And you'll celebrate and feel and raise your hands in here, but then live as, as if he's not your king. And Matthew's not going to give us that option. He's going to say, you have the teachings, Jesus the teacher and Jesus the healer together. And that's who we're after to follow as the church. And he uses this term kingdom on both ends of this throughout his gospel. This is what life is like in the kingdom. Think like there's a new king. This is how life is going to be now. That's what we're we're getting in the Beatitudes. Uh, I hear people say sometimes salvation is asking Jesus into your heart. I'm like, I don't know where that language came from, but it's not the Bible. The Bible talks about the kingdom of God and us walking into the kingdom of God, receiving salvation and walking in to the kingdom. The king has come. He's put his way down for all. Like when a new CEO comes or a new teacher comes and they've got a new culture they bring with them. A new pastor comes into a church revitalization effort and got a new plan that comes with it. And once the church gets around on that, I've seen this many times, they start to experience fresh life and vitality. Generally true with church revitalization, always true with Jesus. The Beatitudes are laying out a new way of life, a blessed life available in the kingdom of God. And he's talking to two groups of people at the same time. The one verses I did want to draw our attention towards is verses one and two today. Look at this. When he saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. You see the two groups? Then he began to teach them. You got the crowds, and then you got the disciples. And at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, here's what's awesome. It says some go from the crowd to the disciples. They begin to believe and follow Jesus. Y'all, just so you know, like, that's kind of our intent with Mercy Church. Our primary purpose in gathering week in and week out is to teach the disciples of Jesus about the ways of the kingdom of Jesus. How do we live our lives by his power and according to his purpose? But we do so in a way so that those of you who might be more of crowd right now, observer kind of looking on so that you can discover Jesus and find true life in him. Just like this whole message was heard by a crowd, we want you to hear it. And over the course of eight weeks, we want you to be able to really consider it. This is why we said last week, we want to make this a place where you can invite, you got that little blue card that those of you who got it are following along, pray for that person who's far from God, but close to you. That's how God has set up the kingdom here on earth is that the people of God would be his plan A for helping introduce other people to the kingdom of God, right? That's what we're after here, even as a church. The purpose of the Beatitudes is to reveal to us, again, just to say it again, reveal to us the blessed life in God's kingdom. Uh, Maybe the last important thing on this first point, God's blessings, this big as we go through this, they're available to his people now and forever. That's important. You see the Beatitudes, if you look back at the section, there are promises, and most of them are future-looking, but the first and the last are present tense. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is right now the kingdom of heaven. What do we make of that now and future? What it means is that Jesus has already brought in the kingdom in some foretaste here and now. And you and I who are in Christ can experience the blessings of the kingdom here and now. But also the full experience is to come. It's kind of like the one that talks about blessed are those who mourn. for They will be comforted. In verse 4, Revelation 21 tells us, man, that will be, certainly will be comforted. Because one day he's going to wipe away every tear. 
there will just be no more. And we, the people of God, we take hope in that promise. But Romans 5 tells me I can rejoice in my present sufferings in Christ because it produces a hope that does not disappoint. So there's a present blessing meant to carry us, sustain us through a, look, y'all, the Bible's real. It's hard in this life. And the Bible speaks to that and gives us something to carry us through and tells us we'll experience the fullness of this blessed state in the age to come. And I take time to say that because we're going to be in this for eight weeks. And as you lean in, there is a now promise for you. You'll experience the blessed life now, not just the age to come. There's promise and there's blessing for you now, as you, just for you to unlock as you take steps to walk with God. A now and a not yet. Now, second part. All right. That's the first part. We doing good? Good? Great. Keep going. What does it mean to be blessed? Again, these overview ones are tough for me, man. What does it mean to be blessed? Over and over, he says, blessed are this group of people who exhibit these characteristics. And blessed, this word, since it's used on over, I was like, man, what a great time for a Greek lesson for you guys. Uh, that's right, my man. Um, if you knew, if you're in here, you know Sparrow, who is Greek, is pumped when we go Greek. Um, all right. The Greek word is makarios, uh, for those of you note takers. We'll just say it this way, M-I-K-A-R-O-I-S, okay? It's got several different English translations over the history of the English language, but the only one other than blessed I want to bring up, some translators will translate this as happy. And I just want to point out that's probably not the best translation, and here's why. Happy in our current English language is a feeling. If you feel happy, then you are happy. The problem with that, of course, is what? Feelings are temporary. You might feel happy now, but then not feel happy later. So we need to talk about makarios as first a fact and then a feeling. Because this blessed word actually does articulate both, but the order is super important, okay? Uh, it's kind of like when I was in college, the first, one of the first discipleship lessons I got was when it comes to your walk with God, you need to remember the fact, faith, and feeling train, okay? And so the idea was, the fact is the engine. The fact that, yes, you are a sinner, but the fact that God sent Jesus, the fact that Jesus lived a sinless life, the fact that Jesus died on the cross as payment for your sin, the fact that he rose from the dead, declaring victory over sin and death for all those who will believe. And the fact that he reigns now at the right hand of the Father and is one day coming back. These facts are to lead your faith. And your faith is the boxcar that you sit in in the train, okay? The engine is the facts. The boxcar is the faith. You put your faith in the facts and then your feelings, that's the caboose. You don't let the caboose drive the train, okay? The caboose comes along, right? and follows your faith and the caboose might waver, which is why the caboose doesn't lead, right? That a little bit of the thing there, maybe an example would be like the, um, the blessing of marriage, right? When you get married, you enter into a fact, like you are married. That is an objective reality. You're married. And with marriage comes blessings, right? You got a new, uh, a new person to share life with. You got a new person to lean on. You have opportunity for children. Like these, these are new this is a fact of marriage, but what do we all know? You don't always feel blessed in marriage. Sometimes you may feel even cursed in marriage, right? Like, why are you like this? Like, I know you're a blessing. That's a fact, according to the Bible, but you're beautiful and insane at the same time. And I don't, I don't understand. Why are we arguing over what kind of orange juice? Like things that you're like, What's going on? Or, or parents, you know the fact. Children are a gift from the Lord. <laughs> well, that's a fact. Do they always feel like a gift from the Lord? I mean, uh, sometimes you just got to sit at home and go, and children are a gift from the Lord. Children are a gift from the Lord. Like, you got to convince yourself. Feelings? I need you because <laughs> they're not there. But I know the fact. Does that make sense? You don't always feel your objective reality. Right? Jesus doesn't say you will always feel happy. But he's saying the fact is, the objectively, the group of people that he's talking about in the Beatitudes, they are blessed. It's a state of being, a state of blessing. They have not achieved it. 
This blessed state has been bestowed upon them by God. So let me give you the, the fact of blessedness, and then I'm going to give you the feeling of blessedness, okay? The fact is, blessedness is the promised favor of God on the people of God. Now, what's that favor? Because I know that word can get kind of thrown around sometimes in Christian circles. First and foremost, it's that we who are in Christ are free from our sin and its consequences. That's the favor of God on you. And then the favor of God is all those promises. The kingdom of heaven. Y'all, we will be comforted. We will inherit the earth. We will be filled. We will be shown mercy. We will see God. We'll be called sons of God. Man, this is the favor of God on us. But it is also a feeling. It's a lived experience here in this life. Here's the, the feeling, the lived experience. Blessedness. And those of you who've been walking with Christ for a while have felt this. It's the deep abiding joy that comes from knowing God and living out the ways of God. First, it's a fact for the people of God, but in his kindness, he made that fact one that we can experience with him in this life. And it's the greatest life there is. That's the invitation of the Beatitudes, to receive the truth, the fact, the forgiveness of of your sins, admittance into the kingdom of God, extended to you as an offer, and then experience the fullness of life in that kingdom. But you can't have the experience of life with God without the fact of receiving that salvation. And it's an understanding that these beatitudes, I hope you'll start to see that. What I'm saying is these aren't talking to eight different groups of people or nine different groups of people. Talking to one people, God's people. And that's where they start to make sense. Otherwise, they're kind of like difficult proverbs, just one after the other, right? Meek will inherit the earth. I mean, if you think about it for a second, it's kind of confusing. After all, if I just, if I think about only my experience in the world, don't the strong control the earth? But it's not just talking about meek people. It's talking about God's people who practice meekness. God's people will inherit the earth. All these are describing what the people of God are to then look like out in the world. And as they live out the ways of God, though it will look strange to the world, upside down to the world, it is in that life you will find and experience true joy, true abundance, true blessing. It's not in building strength, power, money, sexual experiences, travel, whatever. The people of the world believe abundance is there, and it's not. The lasting joy, the satisfied life, is in the kingdom of Jesus as we live out his ways. But with that does come a very difficult third part of the message. The third part of the message for today, as we scan, kind of overview the Beatitudes, what we begin to see is the difficulty of the Beatitudes. When we walk through them for just a moment, you scan back over them and look, you start to realize that even if you agree with them, and even if you have the desire to experience the blessed life they walk you into, we usually fail to live this way. And that can be a heavy burden. I mean, look at it. Blessed are the poor in spirit. You know what that, that means? Blessed are those who recognize they don't have the power to fix all their problems or the problems of the world. Can we just be honest for a second? Is that always you? All the time? Or do you sometimes believe that you're capable enough on your own? Do you sometimes believe, oh, I don't really need God? I would argue the number one problem among upwardly mobile, college-educated people is that they don't need God. Just don't see a need for God. I mean, after all, did God change where your food came from this week? It's a common thing. I mean, uh, why do I need God? And it even creeps into the church. We might want to be poor in spirit, but instead we actually live like we are sufficient in spirit all on our own and thereby negate that blessing. Blessed are those who mourn. Mourning, that's, that's just being able to say, man, I'm not going to tough it out. I'm not just going to pretend like suffering isn't happening. Instead, I'm going to admit my need. I'm going to admit this life is not the way it should be. That's not always us. We tough it out, act like we don't need God again. But that's not even simply talking about grief here. Blessed are those who mourn. It's coming right after poor in spirit because it's talking about mourning in spirit. It's realizing your spiritual problem is actually sin. 
and you're mourning because of your sin. Is that you? Do you grieve your sin or do you tolerate it? Do you pretend like it doesn't exist? You don't confess it and repent of it. You tolerate it. You get acclimated to it. You pretend like it doesn't exist and you're all good. Blessed are the humble. The one who sees the problem isn't just bigger than you. The one who sees the problem isn't just your sin, but one who actually realizes that you are the problem and are humble enough to say, I'm a sinner. I can't save myself. I need God. Is that always you? I can keep going, right? Are you always merciful? Always pure in heart. Always seeking to make peace. That's not a personality trait on the Enneagram, okay? That is a lived pursuit of unity among brothers and sisters in conflict. And remember, the Beatitudes are just a few words in the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, and he says some things after this that set God's standards so high, it seems impossible to live up to. He says, if you look at a woman lustfully, you've broken God's law. He says, love not just your neighbor, but your enemy. Give generously without ever expecting getting anything back or even letting people know it was you. Pray in secret consistently. What you can feel beginning in the Beatitudes that only grows in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is setting a standard I'm going to fall short of. That's the difficulty of the Beatitudes. It's that Jesus sets a standard we can't meet. When we read the Beatitudes, we see what our lives should be like. And if we're real honest, maybe even the kind of life we expect others to live towards us. But we know in our hearts, if we just pause and consider it, it's unrealistic to think that we will live up to this. What a predicament. What the world is our Lord and Savior doing? And here's the beauty of Scripture. Right there as you think that, it's the importance of knowing how to read it. Y'all, this is an ethical teaching, this body of teaching here. This is what your life is supposed to be like. And when you put your actual life up against the way of life, the kingdom you belong to calls you to live, you fall short. And in that moment right there, when you realize you don't live as you're called to live, you don't live as you're created to live, that is when you need what C.S. Lewis called the deeper magic. Because there's something that the enemy of God's people will use against God's people. When they sin, when we sin, when we fall short of the standard that Jesus sets, the enemy will do what he's done for a long time. He'll start leveling accusations against you, and you'll hear it in your heart and mind. It's Revelation 12.10. The accuser is what Satan himself has been called, the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night. This is what he does. He'll see your sin, and he'll accuse you before God. And he's right. You are guilty. So what will happen in your heart in that moment? What response will you choose? Because your experience of the blessing of being in the kingdom of God hangs right there in your response to your sin. Right there when you re recognize you fall short, you are accused, how will you respond? You got to understand this little, this little hinge right here. Because these next eight weeks in the Beatitudes are either going to be a burden or an invitation, depending on how you respond when you see that you fall short. The way the Beatitudes are a burden is when you believe Satan's accusation, but you don't believe Jesus' defense. Satan says to God, look, an imposter. She's not living up to it. He's not living up to it. And you feel it. In that moment, you can either you can, you pretend like it's not real, you can hide or you can wallow in your sin, or you can believe the gospel. The one who hides is the one that pretends like they're not a sinner. They always appear put together, always appear like a good person. Courtney and I see this a lot when we start new community groups. We've been starting community groups now for like 20 years. And we'll see it, man, whenever somebody comes in and they are like always smiling and always saying things like, everything is good. And they just have like a perma smile, like it is good. Everything is great. My life is great. Everything is awesome, right? This is what they just sit there. Man, when they, after they leave, you know, Courtney and I are like, man, they got problems. Like, <laughs> because, y'all, 
Everybody has problems. We all do. Everyone sins. And if you pretend like you don't, if you walk through life like you don't, sin's just going to corrode you from the inside out and the enemy's going to see imposter. Imposter. Your pride is your downfall. But the same is true with the one who uh, recognizes their sin but then wallows in it. The enemy says, see an imposter? You say, yes, you're right. I'm a worthless sinner. I'm no good. I'm no good. I'm no good. And eventually your sense of self-worth just erodes. And I've often seen them wander away from the faith. Here's the thing. Both the one who pretends like there's no sin and the one who wallows in sin is doing the same thing. You're relying on yourself. It's pride. The deeper magic Lewis talked about is discovered when the people who belong to God's kingdom take the focus off themselves and put it on their king. There you're able to say, yes, I am a sinner, but thanks be to God, I have an advocate who defeated the accuser. And I believe the gospel. I I keep saying this deeper magic. It, of course, references back to Chronicles of Narnia. Uh, There was the king, Aslan. He takes the place on the altar of Edmund who broke the law. Right? It's a reminder that the accuser doesn't have the last word. I read you part of Revelation 12.10 about the accuser. Let me read you the full verse, Revelation 12.10, and add 11 onto it. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have now come. Why? Because the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night, has been thrown down. They conquered him. They, that's the brothers and sisters. Hear this. They conquered him. How? By the blood of the lamb. And the word of their testimony, for they did not love their lives to the point of death. Praise God, y'all. The victory in the Beatitudes is the hero, Jesus, takes our place and gives us his victory. That's the deeper magic the enemy doesn't want you to believe. And when you can grab hold of that, that you are free, you are victorious over that accuser in Christ, then the Beatitudes become an invitation. And I hope that's what these next eight weeks are, an invitation for you to walk, not to earn your salvation, but to walk as one who has received the victory from the one who did live these out perfectly who wasn't just poor in spirit. Philippians 2 says he emptied himself, who was meek and humble as he went to the cross, who himself is righteousness and mercy, who made peace between God and man, even as he suffered for it. Throughout this series, you'll see Jesus as the example, but also as the hero, as your hero, right? He had, Matthew has set him up as the teacher and the healer, and that's what we'll focus on. But don't forget Matthew's gospel ends with Jesus, the great redeemer, who goes to the cross for your sins and mine, paying for our sin, dying on the cross. He's buried. Three days later, he resurrects from the grave. And he pulls his disciples, calls them to a life of following him, teaching others all the things that he has taught them like these beatitudes and he says he will be with them always to the ends of the age as we walk through these beatitudes you walk learning about the ways of the kingdom of god having admittance into that kingdom not because of your work but because of his and the amazing promise that he is with you and i now as we learn how to walk according to his ways Let me pray for you and lead you in a time of prayer. As I do that, our worship teams will get in place. I want to give you a chance just to respond to the gospel. Christians, I want you to take this time to maybe confess to the Lord where, man, you have been living in your own strength. Maybe you've been pretending like you're not a sinner. Or maybe you've been like really caught in, caught up in, feeling guilty about your sin. Would you receive victory in Christ and just tell the Lord, ask the Lord, 
Lord, I recognize my pride has gotten in the way of me seeing you. Thank you, God, for the work you have done for me. For those of you that are not Christians, I want to extend the invitation. I'm going to do it every week. Would you receive, come from crowd to disciple, which means receiving Jesus' work on the cross. He went up on the cross because you and I are sinners. We owe a debt because sin is just rejecting God's ways and choosing our ways. And the wage for that sin, the penalty of that sin is death. He went up on the cross to pay it for us. Then he rose from the grave, declaring new life for all those who will believe. He extends that offer of forgiveness, the penalty for your sin, to you now. Would you receive that? So Jesus, I, just a simple prayer in your heart and mind right there. I'll supply the words, but you do it however the Lord leads you. It's just to say, God, I do believe I'm a sinner. I believe I can't save myself. I'll never measure up. But I believe you, the perfect one, paid for my sins so I can have new life. And I receive the forgiveness you won for me. Thank you, God, for saving me. Father, thank you for the work you are doing here in us. I pray these next eight weeks are an invitation from you to celebrate Jesus and what he has done for us and then to learn how to walk in a way that leads to flourishing here. We celebrate our blessedness and walk in that blessed life, experiencing that deep abiding joy you have for us and knowing you and walking according to your ways. We love you. We are thankful. We are thankful 